Well, good afternoon. We are glad everybody's here today. Hope you enjoyed the meal, and I think we're going to have a good presentation. Um, we like to. Uh, we got a new arrangement. We came in here today, and uh, everything was all kind of set up for us. So we're going to have a presentation in the round here for you. So we hope it works out okay. Um, we would also like to. Uh, Welcome any guests that we have here and encourage uh, anybody that hasn't signed up to be a member of the UGA to sign up. We'd encourage that. Um, we're always looking for people to help out and to sign up and can, can do other things. Just a reminder, October 25th and 26th will be the field trip with the guidebook 48. It's the geosites of Utah. It uh, looks like right now, anyway, we're going to be going down through kind of central Utah, San Rafael Swell. Uh, kind of down the Mulberry and back up. We've got a whole bunch of geosites down there that we'll take a look at. So, And then in August 9th through the 11th is that uh, sort of educational family fun trip up to uh, Dinosaur National Park. Uh, we'll have some presentations there that night. It's going to replace our, our August um, uh, picnic that we had up in the, up in the Cottonwoods. But this will be sort of commemorating Bal, uh, Powell's trip down through the Green River. And there'll be a presentation on that. And uh, I think they're going to be doing some rafting on Saturday or Sunday, I guess. So that ought to be a pretty fun trip. And uh, we'll have the meals there that night. The campground's all reserved. Uh, that's been taken care of. So we invite everybody to put that on your calendar and come to that. Also, the golf tournament is scheduled at Stonebridge Golf Course. And it'll be September 13th. So we'll have a, a, a sign-up sheet on the, our web page. If you'll go to that, take a look at that, and get signed up for that. Uh, also, we would like to start getting nominations for the Lehigh Hensey Award in. So uh, please submit your nominations to me, uh, Peter Nelson at utah.gov. Uh, if you'll send those in, we'll start looking at that. Uh, Jan, you want to come up and talk about the guidebook next year? Shorter than that. <laughs> I'm Jan Morse. Um, I work actually with Leslie in the Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining. And she's our president elect for next year and in charge of the guidebook. And she's asked me to be chief editor. So I'm here to invite you to submit abstracts that would fit in with our guidebook. We're doing a, hoping for an update of the publication from 30 years ago that's called Energy and Mineral Resources of Utah. We're going to take that looking toward the future. So we're interested in all kinds of energy resources in Utah. We've even got a, an abstract about the geotechnical engineering of uh, foundations for wind turbines. So that's kind of, you know, all kinds of things like that that have something to do with geology we'd like to, to consider for inclusion in our guidebook. So the abstract deadline has been extended to July 31st. Um, my email, janmorse at utah.gov, is in our newsletter this month. You can submit your abstracts there. And uh, if you know somebody else who's got something interesting that isn't here hearing this announcement, please encourage them to submit an abstract as well. And we're looking forward to seeing what you got. Oh, I forgot to mention, too, um, while supplies last, the authors that go into the guidebook, we'll get a hard copy of that publication from 30 years ago. We've got a little stack of them, so if you're interested in that, get it in early. <laughs> Bill, would you come up and talk about the, the park up at Summit County? Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Um, uh, the uh, the panels for the geologic park are uh, being printed um, as we speak and hopefully um, will be installed, we expect them to be installed later this month. And if you haven't seen them, Utah Geological Survey, you know, Mike Hillen and Mark Milligan and their whole group just did a fabulous job with these things. They just look fantastic. And they're being printed at 30 inches by 42 inches. Um, the uh, the developer, the person that built the park and you know dedicated the land and such, he was so excited about him. He, he's making some additional improvements to the park. So we finally have set a date for our ribbon cutting ceremony, which will be um, 
Saturday, September 21st. So put it on your calendar. The details uh, are to be determined uh, at their, that's in the hands of the, uh, the party people in my Rotary Club, so um, they'll do a good job. So there'll be more information hopefully uh, next month. And uh, so like I said, put it on your calendar. Yeah. This is a this is a very nice park. I stopped in the other day, looked at it, and this this has been well worth the time. So thanks, Bill. It's been good. It's been really really good to have that. So uh, let's see. They've uh, at the as the board we've been looking at a few things about the Teacher of the Year award, and uh, because of complications with the nominating process, they've changed deadlines for the. Rocky Mountain section and the national section for the for the Association of Petroleum Geologists. We're not going to be able to make the deadlines this year. It's changing, so we're not going to have a Teacher of the Year for this year. Uh, we're working on the procedures for getting that rolled out next year. So some new timelines will be coming out um, for the nominations for the Teacher of the Year, and that will be happening next year. They, they've changed everything on us, and and come to find out we're not going to be able to get, get it done in time to get it done this year so unfortunately for that but uh, we are definitely going to up the award cash prize to the teacher and they're going to be able to go to the regional and both to the national sections uh, nominations on that too so we're going to be making changes in there for the teacher of the year award and get more information out on that are there any other announcements that we need to make that we have missed. Okay, uh, we're in for a good presentation, I think, with the geohazards. It kind of gets to be a little more relevant when you have uh, what, 7.1 magnitude earthquakes and fractures in the ground and rocks coming off everywhere, and uh, uh, this is certainly something you have to think about a lot. Uh, those those landscaping rocks are beautiful uh, next to your house, but you always have to consider how that rock got there. <laughs> I don't think that's always done. So uh, we're glad that. So we'll turn the time over to Greg for the introduction. Good afternoon. I'm Greg Schlinker, Program Chair for 2019. Today's speaker is Tyler Knudsen. Tyler is a Utah licensed professional geologist and has been with the Utah Geological Survey's Geological Hazards Program in the Cedar City office for 13 years. <clears throat> Tyler holds uh, a Bachelor of Science in Geology from the University of Utah and a Master of Science in Geology from the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. <clears throat> Tyler has authored or co-authored several studies and maps on the geological hazards of the St. George Basin, Zion National Park, and Glen Canyon National uh, Recreation Area. Other contributions include paleoseismic investigations on the active severe and Washington faults, ground subsidence and earth fissure mapping in southwestern Utah, and emergency response to damaging rockfalls in the Rockville and Zion National Park. Recent projects include the Quaternary Geologic Mapping of the Mineral Mountains, West and Opal Mound Fault Zones at the Utah Forge near Milford, and Comprehensive Geologic Hazard Mapping of the Cedar City Enoch uh, area. Uh, join me in welcoming Tyler. Thanks, Greg, and uh, just want to thank the UGA for giving me this opportunity uh, to come up and talk about some recent projects. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, geologic hazard mapping in the Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. This was uh, uh, partially funded by the National Park Service, um, and it's been a few years in the making, but we'll finally see the light of day here, uh, hopefully pretty soon. Um, Co-authors on this project uh, has been Bill Lund, um, uh, who is UGS Emeritus uh, in the Cedar City office, Adam Hiscock and Steve Bowman uh, out of the Salt Lake office uh, helped with uh, field work and uh, with the, the text document. Um, so the, the, the reason we do these, these geologic hazard maps um, 
is to inform the decision makers, in this case it would be uh, the management of Glen Canyon National Recreation Area on the kinds and the extent of geologic hazards that are within their boundaries. Uh, these are basically red flag maps. Uh, they don't take place of site-specific geotechnical or geologic hazard evaluations. Um, it, it's basically, in this case, it would be if there was to be, if the Park Service needed to build a new campground, if they needed to cut a new trail, something like that. Um, this is something where they could screen different locations and it just helps ensure that geologic hazards uh, are recognized and, uh, and mitigated if necessary uh, before a new infrastructure and for just life safety for visitors uh, to the park, uh, which, which of course is, is, is a big thing uh, for Glen Canyon. Uh, so we've completed similar mapping projects for Zion National Park. Uh, they were really happy with that product. Um, so now Glen Canyon is about complete. And we just got funded uh, with the Bryce Canyon Nat uh, Natural Hist History Association to do a similar project for Bryce Canyon National Park. Uh, that'll be starting hopefully here in, in within the next couple of weeks. Uh, so Glen Canyon National Recreation Area is, is very large. Um, it's about 2,000 square miles, uh, which is uh, marked on this map with that thin gray line. Uh, so, of course, we couldn't map the entire recreation area. That would just be way too much of an under undertaking. Uh, so the areas that are marked shaded in red are what we actually produce the geologic hazard maps for. Um, and that amounts to about 400 square miles. So that's still two fairly large chunks. And they are centered in uh, what, is, what are considered the two of the highest use areas most visited areas of the recreation area. So there's that northern chunk um, that's kind of centered around the Bullfrog and Halls Crossing marinas. And then in the south, uh, there's a large tr chunk that's uh, centered on the Waweep and Lee's Ferry area. Um, and so it was, it was kind of cool to, to cross the border and, and do some work down in Arizona. Um, and and just, just as a kind of a side note, the, when, when you think of Glen Canyon, you think of Lake Powell, uh, which is certainly the heart of the recreation area, but it only accounts for about 14% of the, the area of, the, of the, uh, the unit itself. So it's actually a pretty small part, uh, but it's something that we definitely focused on. Uh, so Lake Powell preceded the creation of Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. Of course, Glen Canyon uh, closed in 1963. It took uh, nearly 20 years for it to fill. Uh, the monument itself, or the recreation area itself was created in 1972. It is the largest uh, national park uh, managed unit in Utah. Uh, they average about two and a half million visitors per year over the last couple of decades, but like most parks in the American Southwest, they've had a, a, a spike over the last couple of years, two to three years. Uh, with the whole Mighty Five campaign and things like that. Um, in 2017, I think they had 4.7 million visitors, uh, which actually surpassed Zion National Park and was the mo most visited uh, National, par or, uh, National Park Service managed unit in the state of Utah in 2017. And since then, visitation's tapered off a little bit, but is still, is still quite high. Um, and of course, most of those visitors are going and they're recreating on the lake. Uh, so again, we kind of focused on hazards that are around the lake. And another factor in choosing those two specific areas were not only that, that they're high use and that's where a lot of the people are recreating, but that is where we had good existing one to 24,000 scale geologic mapping, uh, which is the basis for our hazard maps. Uh, so these are the, the geologic hazards that we mapped, that we considered uh, in the project. Uh, rock fall, flood and debris flow, landslides, surface faulting. Um, there's a whole slew of problem soils that we look at. Um, and then finally, kind of at the tail end, we, we added a radon potential map as well. Um, and so today I'm really, we don't have time to talk about all of these and some of them are not terribly interesting. So I'm really gonna focus today on, on the rock fall, flood and debris flow and the landslide hazards. Those are, those are the hazards that have killed people in the past and are, are the ones that we really focused on and are, are of the most concern for the park service moving forward. 
Uh, the other ones are really just kind of an annoyance, uh, sometimes a very expensive annoyance, um, but we'll, we'll definitely focus on those first three. Um, so in addition to geologic mapping, uh, we have a, uh, a pretty good collection of air photos that we're able to use. A uh, limited number of geotechnical reports around the page area. Be, being in, in a large un, uh, undeveloped area, there's not a lot of geotechnical reports to use. Uh, NRCS soils mapping is very good um, and, is, and has recently been completed for the park. Um, and then we spent uh, several days out on the lake on a boat, which was kind of cool, uh, doing field reconnaissance. Okay, the, the first issue we ran into when we started looking at the available geology uh, was that the geologic mapping only extended down to the 3,700 foot level, which is considered to be full pool for Lake Powell. And the problem is it's been a couple of decades since Lake Powell has been at full pool. So we've got, um, so this is the bullfrog area we're looking at here. You can see where the extent of geologic mapping was, and you can see this large expanse of area, um, including most of the marina facilities um, that are well below that 3,700 foot level. So we actually didn't have existing, we, we realized we didn't have existing mapping for these areas that are populated with lots of uh, recreators, people camping, boaters, um, so the first, thing we decided to do is we need to try and extend that geology down to at least the 3,600 foot level because it's gonna be a long time until Lake Powell reaches full pool again. So that was the first thing we, we did. And so we went ahead and did that, filled that in, took a little bit more time, um, but the maps would be pretty useful, useless if we just stopped at that 3,700 foot level. Okay, so uh, landslides w is really one of the first hazards uh, that the, the uh, well, even before it was turned into a national recreation area, it was really managed by the, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation initially. As the reservoir began to fill, uh, on the lee sides of all of these canyons as they were being flooded, uh, were these existing big sand piles, essentially sand dunes on the lee sides of all of these canyons. And as the reservoir filled and began to saturate these sand piles, uh, they would fail. And a lot of times they would just fail within a matter of minutes, matter of hours, and overnight these big sand piles, once the water would hit them, they would just slip into the lake uh, very rapidly. And so as you can imagine, that would, that would be a, a considerable hazard. So the the Bureau of Reclamation, they, they monitored these sand piles pretty closely uh, throughout the 1970s and into the early 80s. And so these, these photos that I'm showing you here are from the Bureau of Reclamation from uh, some of these early uh, reconnaissance uh, inventories that they used to do of these sand piles. Uh, so that was kind of the first landslide issues that, the, that they had to deal with as the lake filled up. There's another example of these, these sand piles slipping very rapidly. Uh, in all of our reconnaissance, we, I don't recall ever really seeing anything like this. So once it reached full pool in 1980, and then you kind of had fluctuating lake levels in the, in the decade after that, uh, it really looks like all these sand piles have kind of slipped into the lake and that hazard from these unconsolidated sand dunes along the shore really isn't there. It's been greatly reduced. Um, if we do have prolonged periods of drought, the, uh, these, you know, there, there's an endless supply of sand and so these sand dunes can regenerate pretty quickly. Uh, so they, they could certainly pop up again and be a hazard, uh, but, but we really didn't see a lot of this. So this is kind of a hazard that's, that's uh, not a big deal anymore, these, these sand piles. Uh, but what is a big issue um, are these massive landslides uh, that were mostly pre-existing. Um, so Glen Canyon, uh, so particularly in areas like Good Hope Bay, uh, around the Rincon, the San Juan Arm, um, and also in Lee's Ferry, uh, there are just these, these massive landslides anywhere where the Chin Li crops out on slopes. Uh, there were existing landslides before Lake Powell even existed. Uh, and some of these are miles long, uh, just huge Tariva style uh, landslides um, throughout the canyon. 
And so it's thought that these are mostly, were mostly dormant before the, the reservoir was created uh, and were likely triggered uh, back in the late Pleistocene or sometime in the Pleistocene. Um, if you look at the landslides, and we will here in a second, um, at Lee's Ferry, where there isn't a reservoir, uh, these landslides are highly dissected, and you can tell that they've been there for a really long time. So not a lot of historical movement unless you're around the lake, and then uh, pretty much all of them have been moving um, as they've been saturated by, by the reservoir. And uh, so not only is the reservoir filled and you raised pore water pressure and you lubricated slide surfaces reactivating, you know, all these large landslides and rooted in the Chinle. Um, so not only during the infilling, but also during periods of drawdown. So after the Lake Powell reached its full pool in 1980, it stayed very high for several years. Uh, we almost lost Glen, Glen Canyon Dam in 1983 uh, as it almost overtopped. Um, but by the late 1980s and into the 90s, as we started to enter periods of drought and lake levels started to drop, um, there have been times where Lake Powell's basically only been half full. Um, those periods of rapid, fairly rapid drawdown also create, uh, help reactivate some of these large landslide masses um, as the surrounding rock and unconsolidated material as that water that was saturated in there is, is trying to readjust and re-equilibrate to that, to that lower base level. So you get re even further reaction of, of reactivation of some of these landslides. Uh, so here's, here's an example. This is at the mouth of Tickaboo Canyon. And I, I don't know, we, I'm not, I haven't been able to figure out exactly when this, the edge, the kind of the end of this little peninsula failed. Um, you can see in 1972, it was definitely there. The U.S. Bureau of Reclamation did a pretty detailed uh, shoreline reconnaissance of all mass movements on the lake in 1980, and they did not indicate that there were any issues at this point at Tickaboo Canyon, uh, beside, um, and they, they had flagged other areas nearby, uh, so they definitely looked at this area. So sometime between 1980 and about 1993, uh, when air photos uh, show um, that this had collapsed, there is a window in there uh, where there was this massive failure, and don't know for sure, but this may have been during a period of drawdown, and I, and I suspect it may have been uh, when, it, and instead of failing when it was full, it is actually during a drawdown when this may have failed. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to, to, if you look at the landslides beyond the lake, um, down in the Lees Ferry area, uh, which is within the study area, uh, these landslides have shown absolutely no evidence of movement. Um, so it's, it's quite obvious that it's, you know, it's that lake effect that's reactivating these large slides. Um, I don't think there's a single mapped historical landslide in the study area um, beyond uh, where the lake is. Um, although these are still really weak geologic units and they still, if you get in there and start messing around with them, you can get sliding. And uh, a good example is the Bitter Springs landslide. If you've, if you've ever taken Highway 89 from Page down towards um, the Grand Canyon and you, you take that steep grade down through the Echo Cliffs, uh, that big road cut uh, back in, in uh, 2013, uh, a 500 foot section of that road failed catastrophically um, in one of these uh, previously dormant landslides uh, because of the cut and because of poor drainage uh, that failed. So if you get in and start screwing around with these slopes, they certainly can be reactivated uh, in part. Um, and so an interesting thing I came across is, is we, as we were kind of looking at some of these, these dormant landslides that were pre-existing before the lake, uh, an interesting kind of theory that's been postulated out there is the idea of Pleistocene lakes that filled Glen Canyon, uh, which is interesting and, and is, is quite controversial. And I don't think anyone really knows if these existed for sure or not. Um, I guess it, it was Ken Hamlin at BYU that kind of postulated uh, these Pleistocene lakes initially. Um, and so there were a number of them, and the largest one uh, would have been the Prospect Lava Dam. So these are, uh, there's a series of cinder cones in the Uinkaret volcanic field in the Western Grand Canyon, uh, where you got these 
vent areas and the lavas, uh, the eruptions would flow down into the canyon, create a dam, and uh, create a reservoir behind it that would fill Glen Canyon. And the Prospect Lava, Lava Dam erupted about a half a million years ago. This would have been the largest. And if it really did exist, uh, this would have backed up uh, and created a reservoir that would have had a surface elevation at about the 4,000 foot level, uh, which is about 300 feet higher than uh, what Lake Powell is today. And essentially, it would have backed up into Glen Canyon uh, to about where Moab is today. So that, as you could imagine, would trigger many landslides on these, on these exposed Chinle slopes uh, in the canyon and its tributaries. And, uh, you know, as, and it's also postulated that these dams eventually would burst and fail catastrophically, and so you'd have very fast drawdown, which would trigger even additional landslides. So I don't know that this has definitely been disputed by more recent work, uh, people that have doubted that these dams would have been strong enough to hold back a reservoir of this size, that they, they would have been that stable. Uh, there, there generally is a lack of evidence of, of large lakes occupying Glen Canyon in the Pleistocene. Uh, so I don't know, uh, but we know that these things are basically dormant. They were more active in the Pleistocene, but now that where, where the lake has saturated these, they are, they are certainly an issue and, and they um, can, can be a, a hazard for sure. And they are the, the high, highest hazard that's uh, on our hazard maps. Um, let's see, so let's uh, move on to rockfall. So when we were evaluating rockfall, the two main things that we focus on uh, are the rock sequence. So there, there's a number, and I've got four of them listed there, of rockfall producers where you've got these massive sandstones that are underlain by very weak, clay-rich, uh, slope formers uh, that erode out fairly easily, and so, and a lot of times you're left with overhanging masses of sandstone. And so, those, those, the four main rock sequences uh, that kind of automatically give you a high hazard uh, when you get, when they form these cliffs are the Navajo sandstone that's underlain by the Cayenta, uh, the Wingate sandstone that's underlain by the weaker Chin Lee, uh, the Entrada sandstone. Uh, which is underlain by the Carmel and the Shinarump conglomerate over the top of the Monkopi, uh, which you see in the Triassic section uh, near Lee's Ferry. And so in addition to that, uh, we also looked at joints, which plays a pretty vital role. And so if you look at those rock sequences alone, if you look around the, uh, the, the shorelines of Lake Powell, you've got vertical cliffs of, uh, you know, whether it's Navajo sandstone if you're up lake, or the Entrada if you're down in the Wawweep area, um, essentially you would have a high hazard all along the shores of, of Lake Powell. And uh, the, the you know, management of the Park Service knows already that's a high hazard along these cliffs. And so that we figured that really wouldn't be useful if we just marked everything as a high hazard. And so we wanted to discriminate a little bit more and that's when we really kind of focused on the joint patterns. And we noticed that we, you do, obviously you get more prolific rockfall generation where you've got closely spaced joints, where you have these high joint densities. And so that was something that we looked at. We mapped these discontinuities. Um, so we looked at both regional joints, um, which look, look in the, from the air, they look like this. These are often miles long. Uh, they often date back to the Laramide orogeny uh, as these rocks were flexed. Um, and in the canyons, they kind of look like this in the canyon walls. And pretty much everywhere where you see these, these high joints, you have very large cones of talus that have, that have piled up underneath them. So we knew that these were, you know, if you have a, a, a coherent, nice, strong cliff face. You don't have as much rockfall generation, but where it's busted up with joints, you get these large piles of talus. Uh, so in addition to the regional joints, uh, there are the stress relief or the secondary stress relief joints, which are very common along the canyon walls. And so these develop as these canyons are excavated by erosion, uh, you, you lose that that lateral confining pressure, the cliff face relaxes, uh, and you get these, these joints that, that pop up. And so these can be straight if the canyon, if the cliff face along the canyon wall is straight, the, 
these stress relief joints are often straight, uh, but uh, if it's, a, if you're in a meander of one of these entrenched canyons, they're often curvilinear and they mimic that cliff face. And here's, here's an example of Forgotten Canyon. Um, so obviously where, where you've got these, these joints, it allows water to infiltrate and it just, um, it accelerates the weathering process um, through freeze thaw, uh, chemical weathering, all those sorts of things. And uh, so you can note, Oh, there's a bunch of boats down here that are underneath this. Um, in a few places, and here's what the here's what these stress relief joints look at look like down in the canyon. There are a few places where these actually interfere with each other, and you get you have a regional stress or a regional uh, the regional joint sets, and the secondary joints will uh, overprint the older joints at a right angle, a wide angle, which kind of dices up the rock mass into these pillars. And sometimes the secondary joints are inclined and they dip towards the canyon. Uh, so it makes these nice wedge-shaped uh, pillars of rock. Um, and so that's, that's where you really get your most prolific amounts of rock fall is where, they, where those interfere with each other. And we see that a lot uh, more in the southern part near Waweep. And uh, in addition to, to looking at the rock sequence, the, you know, the, the, the hard rocks over the soft rocks, uh, and looking at the secondary joints, the, uh, the, the various uh, fractures. We also looked at where rocks are overhanging or the alcoves. Uh, these are very common in a lot of the canyons near Bullfrog in the northern part of the, of the study area. Um, almost always underneath these overhangs, of course, you can have big piles of talus, which attest to the, the amount of rock fall that happens here. And the big problem is, is that boaters really love alcoves. If it's raining, it gets you out of the rain. If it's hot, it gives you shade. So it's very common to see people pitching their tents right up underneath in some of these alcoves. And, uh, you know, some of them might be a little bit stable, but in others, uh, you know, where, there, where there's such prolific rock fall, where there's, you know, vegetation hasn't been able to establish itself, and uh, there's, you know, plenty of fresh rock fall scars on the roof, uh, you can see that it's a, a pretty tenuous situation. So here's uh, what the rock, here's an example of a uh, little snippet of one of the rockfall hazard maps. Uh, so the Smith Fork Forgotten Canyon, this is near Bullfrog. And so what you're looking at here, you'll see red lines. And so we mapped more than 10,000 discontinuities. So anything we could see in our photos or in our reconnaissance, we mapped the distribution of these fractures in the rock. And then we also, where we saw overhangs in the reconnaissance or in air photos, we would map those as well. And that, so all the green lines, in this case, it's, it's usually on that outside bend of these entrenched meanders. Uh, we mapped hundreds of these overhangs. And so this allows just a simple, quick, qualitative assessment of these cliffs surrounding the lake. Um, and, it, and, it, and there really was a good correlation in the field where we had, where you, where you can see these these fractures where you have overhanging masses, that's where you'd have big piles of talus. Um, and it's where the pantina or the, um, yeah, the pantina on the rock, you could tell was fresher or there was no pantina because uh, that cliff face was spalling rock um, at, a, at a regular rate. Uh, so, so the red and the oranges you see here, so the, the red is the very high hazards, which are mapped adjacent to where you either have a lot of the joints uh, or you have overhanging rock masses. And if it's a more coherent cliff face, it's just high. So we're not being super discriminatory, but high versus very high. And I, we thought that would be a lot more useful to the park service than just mapping everything the same. And then another thing we were able to do with the rockfall hazard map is not only did we we didn't just stop at the 3,600 foot level where the geologic mapping ends, but we have very good bathymetry data uh, that kind of shows the shape of the, of the canyon down to where the Colorado River would be below the reservoir. 
and we also have pre-dam air photos. So we were able to extend, uh, and we generally use about a 22 degree, sh we use shadow angles uh, that we project using GIS from, uh, from the source area to kind of determine how wide these hazard zones are. Uh, but with, we, we felt like we had enough data to project those uh, well below where the, where the reservoir is today uh, with fluctuating levels. So this is one of the hazards we were able to project all the way down to the, to the bottom of the canyon. Okay, so really quickly, just a couple of notable rock falls uh, through the history uh, that we were able to dig up uh, looking through the archives um, there at Glen Canyon. Uh, 1974 uh, is what we're looking at here, that this entire cliff face collapsed. Uh, so you're looking about 500 feet tall, at least 1,000 foot long, and a couple of tens of feet thick wall of Navajo sandstone collapsed. Uh, this is along the main channel, about mid-lake uh, near Iceberg Canyon. And unfortunately, there, there was a boat parked that had anchored on the opposite side of the channel. And so when this collapsed, it created a large displacement wave and it lifted that boat and deposited it uh, about a 40 feet above the shoreline. Um, and so displacement waves are a legitimate concern at Lake Powell. Um, there's, we got two examples here of how, uh, we're not aware of any, anybody being killed, but people have been injured by displacement waves. Um, and you can just imagine in some of the smaller canyons how if you have a large rock fall, it, it really spreads the hazard beyond, you know, just a, just a local rocks falling and smashing something directly below it. But it, it can extend, you know, for hundreds of yards, miles into some of these narrow canyons. Um, and, and just imagine, you know, a family that's, that's camped right near the shoreline, middle of the night, big rock fall, could be half a mile away and just have a wall of water. Uh, this displacement wave just bore up into the canyon uh, and it, you know, it would ride up the shoreline and could easily sweep tents and campers and swamp boats and, uh, and, and cause a problem. Uh, let's see, so in 1975, so Lake Powell wasn't even full, uh, hadn't even reached, um, full capacity yet, 1975, a large rock fall. Uh, and a lot of these deaths uh, were in alcoves, people seeking shelter. In 1975, that was the case at Padre Bay, uh, a boat uh, with a couple uh, were seeking shelter from a rainstorm nestled up uh, in an alcove, uh, which subsequently collapsed. Uh, the roof of the alcove collapsed on them. Uh, one fatality and, and there were nearby boaters that were able to rescue uh, another person that was just injured. Uh, so another displacement wave problem in 1987, uh, Llewellyn Gulch, uh, which is tributary to the Escalante arm uh, of Lake Powell, uh, which is this photo right here. Uh, there's a, a, a pretty good sized slab that fell off the, the wall here of Navajo Sandstone. It just happened to fall right as a speedboat was going by and it instantly beached that speedboat. Um, and so it, Beat the, beat the driver up pretty good, but he survived. Um, see, 1999, that uh, was another fatality. This was along the San Juan River. Uh, it was within the National Recreation Area, but I think, I believe it was upstream from Lake Powell. Uh, and this was, this is up in, the, I think this was Pennsylvania, Pennsylvanian Paradox Formation and a, a camper, and uh, according to the, to the reports, it was actually a, a Division of Wildlife Resource employee uh, that was camped at the base of this cliff, and during an intense rainstorm, uh, part of the cliff failed, and part of the deposit, uh, and, that, and that camper was partially crushed uh, from that material. So another fatality in, in 2007, uh, really small, Alcove, uh, some fisher, a, a couple from uh, Colorado were fishing and they, there's just enough room to get a boat inside this alcove and they got nestled in there and were fishing and, the, and the, the roof of that just happened to collapse on them, killed them both instantly. Um, and according to the incident report, some passerbys had reported that they 
had their anchor and they were trying to pound it into crevices into the in the in the rock in the alcove. So this one may not have been completely a natural rock fall, but we don't know for sure. Uh, one body was found immediately. The other one went down with the rocks and they couldn't find it and it didn't surface uh, until six years later. Body came to the surface and they found it in 2013. Okay, uh, one, one of the, the really eye openers as we were doing reconnaissance and we were going around and the park service was showing some areas that they were also concerned with uh, was Horseshoe Bend. Um, and so here's kind of an aerial shot uh, from Google of Horseshoe Bend. Uh, there's a trail, it's super easy access. You just park on the side of the highway. Things are changing and I'll, and I'll get to that. Uh, super easy, half mile or less trail. You don't have to pay anything. There's no entry. You don't need a park pass or anything. Takes you to the rim and you kind of get that money shot of this big meander of the Colorado River uh, below Glen Canyon Dam. And this is a very active, this, 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 the rim of the canyon here is eroding like crazy. There's huge cones of talus under here. Uh, not only do you have an extensive regional joint system, uh, it's a little bit hard to see by the viewing area because there's, there's a lot of sand covering these joints, but there's east-west joints through here. There are cliff face parallel joints, those secondary stress relief joints that are, that are cut, dicing this rock up. Uh, so very, very unstable situation. And the visitation here is just incredible. It used to be a secret place, you know, 10, 15 years ago. There's, you know, a few photographers knew about it. The locals there at Page knew about it, but very, very few people actually came to this rim. Uh, but in the age of Instagram, uh, you know, everybody has to get a selfie at Horseshoe Bend. It's very easy to do it. It has been free for a very long time. So on any given day during the tourist season, you could find a thousand people crawling over this, this very unstable rim, a uh, thousand feet above the Colorado River. Um, and there's, there's no barriers. Uh, at the time we were looking at Horseshoe Bend, there was a sign in the parking lot uh, that talked mostly about heat stroke, avoiding heat stroke. And there's one little sentence there about avoiding getting too close to the crumbly rocks on the edge. And that was it. You'd, you'd, you'd follow this trail out and it would literally deposit you on top of this thing. So this is kind of where people would go to get their money shot. There's this, this little platform, little rock platform that the trail ends at. And you go out there and set up your tripod get out your selfie stick. And, uh, and you know, when we were there, we saw lots of people scrambling on top of this. And if you kind of get around to the side and start looking at what's actually holding up this little rock platform, you realize that there's really nothing holding it up and you start to wonder why it's even still there. Uh, and you can see where there's been recent, you know, chunks of this little pedestal that's, you know, that wedge that's holding it up has, have, have fallen. Um, so th this was a major concern, uh, just Googling Horseshoe Bend, this is one of the first photos that came up, you know, detached blocks. So th this was a huge concern to us, and so we, we made some recommendations. We don't always, in these hazard folios, we don't often make specific recommendations, but sometimes we do, and we definitely did for, for Horseshoe Bend. Uh, at a minimum, we wanted to, in we told them you should at least increase your signage so people are aware. Um, I forgot to mention in 2010 there was a death and that and because of rocks crumbling underneath somebody's feet uh, there have been a number of deaths since 2010 uh, but they were not witnessed so we're not sure you know some of them were probably suicides uh, some of them may have just been tripping and falling and others may have been you know rocks crumbling underneath their feet we really don't know um, but it, it's something that is certainly going to continue and the few people are going to continue to fall uh, whether it's rocks crumbling or not. Um, so our recommendations were at least at a minimum increase signage. We would, and for rocks like that, those smaller detached blocks where the weight of a human would be a significant factor of, you know, increasing or uh, affecting the safety and the stability of that block, 
we suggest that they either need to scale that, put a little fence or a sign or something, um, but people that unbeknownst are just going up to the edge and a large number of people and, and can't really see what's underneath them, uh, we, we thought that, they, that Park Service had to do something. And so these recommendations, the contract deliverable were delivered to the Park Service in early 2017. And I don't know if that had any kind of bearing on what has happened at Horseshoe Bend, uh, but by mid 2017 and late 2017, the Park Service began constructing a viewing deck uh, in, the, in the exact spot where some of these really bad problem rocks were. Um, and so I don't know if, the, and, I, and I haven't been to the viewing deck, I don't know if they actually scaled some of those rocks or if they just built this platform right over the top. Uh, but by all appearances, it looks like they, they have eliminated at least some of the, ha the hazard from some of those really obviously uh, bad rocks. So this is now complete, it was completed in 2018, it certainly makes the area much more safer uh, with the fence. Um, you are still allowed to wander beyond the fenced area, and, I, and I'm not sure what this sign says, but hopefully it's warning, you know, if you go beyond this fence, be aware of, of uh, unstable conditions near the edge. Uh, but things are definitely improved there. And, and the last I've heard is uh, not only do they have now have a viewing deck, and you can, you can actually, it's ADA compliant, you can actually get a wheelchair out there now, which is kind of cool. Um, but I guess they've had problems with the parking area, and so now they're gonna start busing people. They'll have you stop and page, and they're actually gonna bus you, and it's not gonna be free, you know, 10 bucks or something. Uh, so I think we're gonna see visitation go, maybe go down a little bit here. Uh, but things are definitely safer uh, at Horseshoe Bend, which is kinda nice to see. Okay, um, let's go on to flooding. So this uh, by far has caused the most fatalities uh, due to geologic hazards in the Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. Uh, so there's been 16 fatalities that we know of, um, and most of those have been due to flash floods. So these are monsoonal, uh, thunderstorm type floods, and got lots of slot canyons. It's not really renowned for its slot canyons, but uh, it's becoming better well known uh, within the canyoneering community. Uh, there are a lot of really neat canyons. They're becoming much more popular. And um, so we'll talk about a, a couple of different things in addition to the flash floods. Down by Lee's Ferry, debris flows, debris floods, this sort of thing is pretty much a yearly occurrence um, during the monsoon season. Uh, because of all these drainages that are, have their headwaters in, in the Chinle and the Monkopi, very flashy. Um, and so the, the access road into Lee's Ferry is, is often damaged and the culverts get jammed uh, pretty much every summer, anytime they have a big thunderstorm. That's a big problem. Uh, we'll also look at the Perea River. Uh, okay, so slot canyons, it's not hard to understand why these are such a hazard. Uh, they're often so narrow, you can't see what kind of weather may be impending. Um, a lot of times these are drainages are quite large and it could be raining, you know, 15, 20 miles away and you would never know uh, because of the limited visibility, you, you wouldn't be able to see uh, what might be coming your way, that wall of water from that, that distant thunderstorm. Um, and there's, in a lot of cases there's uh, no easy way out of these, so even if water levels do rise, uh, there's not always an easy way of egress out of these slot canyons. Um, so I think I had mentioned there were 16 deaths. So one of the, one of the biggest tragedies uh, near Lake Powell uh, was in August uh, 12th, 1997, when 11 of those 16 deaths occurred. Uh, and this was in Antelope Canyon. Uh, so that's what this photo here is, the famous, you know, corkscrew and those intricate, intricately carved canyon. Uh, that's actually on the Navajo Nation, which is just south of the, of the, of the recreation area. Uh, but it's very close and it drains into Lake Powell, so it's, it really is a good example to look at. Um, so 11 tourists were swept away. The, depending on what account of the, of the incident you read, uh, the storm was either 
five miles away or it might have been 30 miles away. I'm not sure. Uh, but it was apparently sunny and not raining in Antelope Canyon when these tourists were down there getting their pictures. And they were completely surprised, taken uh, off guard when this wall of water hit them in the canyon and swept them away. Uh, so the 11 tourists died. Uh, there was a, a tour guide with them that ended up surviving. He had all his clothes stripped off. He was bloodied, bruised. Uh, they, you know, the people that pulled him out of the canyon said he looked like he'd been in an airplane wreck. Um, and of those 11 tourists that died, uh, so eight, eight of those bodies were recovered in Lake Powell uh, within the, the first week or two. Uh, t there was one body that was found in the canyon that kind of got crammed up into a, a, in a, in a bend in the, in the slot canyon. And there's still two uh, that are unaccounted for. So there's two bodies that were never recovered. And apparently they still have, occasionally the debris flow in Lake Powell's low, they still search that debris flow or the, the, de the debris, debris deposit at the mouth of the canyon uh, with cadaver dogs occasionally. So in addition to the slot canyons, which are gonna, that hazard will increase and the risk will increase as more people start exploring and discover those canyons. Uh, hanging, hanging canyons are, are a big issue. Um, so these are ephemeral tributaries to the main Glen Canyon uh, where a lot of them are hanging. They could be 10 feet, they could be 100, a couple of hundred feet above the lake, uh, above lake level and uh, a lot of times Boaters really don't have it on their radar. Um, some of these hanging canyons, uh, which are you know normally ephemeral and dry, you don't really notice them. But when it rains, they create these these large waterfalls. Sometimes that they're they're at the head of alcoves, and so a lot of the initial thing that boaters do when it starts raining is they look for alcoves for shelter. And you can see the issue if if somebody were to you know rush and get into this alcove. Um, it could be a you know several minutes to hours delay before that waterfall really kicks in, um, and not only you know the weight of the water can swamp boats, but these flash floods are often entrained with lots of sediment, large boulders, uh, which which can sink and kill and uh, cause all kinds of problems. And it can also create uh, powerful eddies that can suck your boat in if you're if you get too close to these. So here's a pretty good example, June 6, 2015. Uh, there are several families that were camped in Crystal Springs Canyon, uh, which is uh, near Hall's Crossing. And these guys were camped, started raining. They didn't really think much of it. Uh, they didn't really notice there, there is a, a, a slightly hanging canyon about 20 feet above lake level, uh, normally ephemeral. And they had their boats parked there. Nobody was in the boats, uh, but this wall of water suddenly came down, started churning up the lake, created a powerful eddy, immediately ripped their boats from their anchors, started tossing the boats around. Uh, all the boats were heavily damaged. One of them was sank uh, when large boulders uh, hit the boat, damaged it, sunk it. Um, nobody was hurt or injured in this. They were able to be rescued. Uh, nobody was hurt. But um, it's a good example of what happens if you get too close to these hanging canyons. Okay, I want to talk about the Perea River. So this is below the lake. Uh, this is kind of right where you go from Glen Canyon, uh, the bottom of the Glen Canyon and where the Grand Canyon begins. Uh, and the Perea River is that uh, it's, you look at it, you know, when during good weather and it's just this little dinky stream, uh, but it's got a 14,000 square mile drainage area. So if you get a heavy thunderstorm somewhere in that drainage, this thing can flash and it can flash really big. Um, so it's got a long history of flooding and uh, more importantly, right here at the confluence. So here's the Perea River. Uh, this is Lonely Dell Ranch. Uh, this are, these are the NPS park maintenance facilities, fairly large, substantial buildings that are right here near the mouth of the Perea River Canyon. And here's where you put in, if you float the Grand Canyon, here's the, the launching uh, ramp for, uh, for going down the Grand Canyon. And so I, 
after looking at the history of the Perea River and some historical photos, and after doing recon, when we came and we did recon back in, I think it was 2014, and walking around these maintenance facilities, we could see former river channels right behind these maintenance facilities. And it, it really is a wonder what the Park Service was thinking when they built these, honestly. Um, so we'll take a closer look at this. So just from kind of moderately large flash floods, thunderstorm-induced flash floods in this kind of late summer, early fall of 2013, 2014, caused about 100 feet of lateral erosion that we can see in our photos. Um, so the Perea River really wants to just go straight, wants to take that shortcut and to the Colorado River, and it has in the past. This, this, the river has kind of been all over the place in, uh, in the recent geologic past, uh, and it's eventually, if the Park Service doesn't do something substantial, uh, they have installed uh, these cute little gabions, um, but they're, they're, I, I don't, I'm not even sure if they're still there. Uh, so in 2014, we saw them freshly installed, uh, but they're gonna have to do something more than that if they wanna preserve these, these buildings there. Uh, so here's an example of, of some of these historical photos that are out there. Uh, the one on top was taken in 1910, and that's the one I kinda want you to focus on. There's lots of stuff on these, on these photos. Uh, so this is kinda looking from west to east. So we're looking down the Perea River there's the Colorado running from left to right. And this red oval is where the maintenance facilities are today. So essentially coincident with the mouth of the Perea River in 1910. So that, that river is avulsed and has been all over the place and eventually it's, it's gonna wanna go this way again. Um, so we, we tried to stress that, make it obvious in our, in our report uh, that the Perea is nothing to be messed with and eventually, um, based on the history and these uh, large avulsions of the river, um, they're gonna have to do something a little bit more substantial if they wanna try and keep those uh, maintenance facilities there. Okay, and so here's Zoe, did take pictures. So in 2014, here's those freshly installed cute little gabions. Um, and in 2016, I just saw this in the news in a press release from the National Park Service. These aren't this, this is on the opposite side of the Perea River, just right across the way. Uh, but similar gabions that were installed probably at the same time as the other ones um, that were installed to protect the road that goes up to uh, Lonely Dale Ranch. Um, and they, I mean, they, they were torn out pretty easily. I'd be surprised if these are even still there today. I don't know, have you ever, Adam's, I'm looking at Adam, because he, he, he knows where they're at, and I know he's spent some time down there uh, floating rivers, but, so I'd be surprised if these are even still there today, but I, I don't know. They're gonna have to do something more substantial than that, though, for sure. Okay, so, uh, so the, the, the hazard maps were, we hope that, um, we hope the Park Service will be able to use these. Uh, we really don't anticipate a lot of new construction in Glen Canyon National, uh, in the recreation area. There is an increase in visitorship, so sometimes they will build new campgrounds to dis to kind of just dis disperse visitors, uh, new trails, uh, you know, bathrooms. I don't know. So. We certainly hope the, the, the hazard maps will help for new construction, don't anticipate a lot of that, but really uh, it, it comes down to visitor safety and that's the thing that's got us most concerned. Uh, most people that come to Glen Canyon, they come to recreate on the lake and you know, moving rocks and flash floods in a desert, I don't think it's on people's radar a lot of the times when they, when they go to Lake Powell. They're not thinking of these things. And so our hopes are that they can use the material, the photos that are in, you know, particularly with rockfall and flash floods. Those are the two big ones that have killed in the past. And it's two things that are not on people's minds. We hope they can use the material, the information, the photos that are in the study and ed educate visitors, you know, it doesn't have to be anything too substantial. It could just be a simple photo of what an unstable cliff face looks like. 
um, you know, how to recognize an alcove that might have, be actively failing, um, you know, uh, tips on how to, you know, avoid getting into slot canyons if there's any kind of chance for rain, just simple things like that. Um, I think it go a long way in trying to educate, you know, whether that's web-based materials or, or giving brochures uh, to boaters. Uh, they really need to increase the education about geologic hazards and particularly rockfall and flooding. Um, so in the past, you know, if you, they, we were able to dig up some old ones from the 80s, some old brochures that they used to distribute. Uh, but recently, they really, it seems like they've gone away from that. And uh, so that, that's one of our hopes is that they can kind of educate people more um, on some of these hazards. So the status, so if you want to read this report, uh, the original work and the contract deliverable was completed in early 2017. And really the big problem we ran into um, was we had 10 different hazard maps and we had about 15 different quadrangles that cover that large study area. So we were looking at about 150 PDF maps, seven and a half minute quadrangles, uh, which was just gonna be a headache. And so it was decided to wait. Uh, we are in the, in the process of creating a web map application where we're gonna put all of our hazard mapping data. And so it was decided instead of fiddling around with 150 plus maps, which would be a pain in the butt, let's just wait and release the map data on the web application. And so that's happening. And then so while we were kind of figuring that out, I had Grant Willis who mapped most of the geology uh, kind of do one final review of the text, and he had a lot of really good comments. Um, and one of them was, why isn't there a radon hazard map? And that was a really good question, and so um, I was able to add another chapter and add that mapping as well. Um, so this will be released soon. Can't say exactly when, but it, it will be soon. It is in the final stages. Uh, and then the very final thing I just want to run through is, uh, I just kind of want to vent my frustration. You know, all, all this work, all this effort to try and make people, you know, visitors to Lake Powell safer. And then as you're doing research online and you come across YouTube videos and Instagram photos of people just doing really dumb things at Lake Powell and it kind of makes you wonder like, what's the point? You know, are, you know, obviously if people are gonna, you know, cliff off 100 foot cliffs, are they really gonna be worried about a, a little flash flood or, a, you know, a rock falling down on them? Um, so th this is a still from a video. Uh, this is the last moments of this guy's life. He didn't survive this jump, and his family donated the photo to the Park Service and wanted them to, you know, use this photo as an example. It, you know, don't jump off the cliffs, and, and it is actually illegal. Anything over 15 feet is illegal to jump off of at the park. Um, that doesn't matter, it doesn't stop people, it's obviously ignored. So you can find photos and videos of people, you know, 100 feet plus jumping off. Uh, three at a time, why not? Uh, why stop there? You know, 50 foot slip and slide up the ante. So, uh, the, the balloon launcher, you know, you, you blow up a big balloon, put it next to your houseboat. You sit on one end, get your largest friend to jump off the top of the houseboat and launch you in the air and just hope you land on something soft. Uh, some more of that. Uh, my favorite, the jet ski slingshot. You know, have your buddy on the jet ski, uh, you know, just gun it and launch you off a, a ramp off the beach. Uh, so it's, it's a little frustrating to see this, but um, it's, it's still it's still a fun project, and I'll just stop there. I'm out of time. So thank you. We have uh, time for one or two questions. Yeah. Um, great presentation. <laughs> By coincidence, on, in today's Wall Street Journal, there was an article: Instagram turns obscure U.S. sites into social media destinations. And the, there's a color photo, white-angle photo of Quebec. Oh. A whole bunch of people, not on the. Uh, Right. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing how some of these places just explode overnight. You know, once it once it gets on Instagram, everybody's got to get that same photo. What's the draw the horseshoe bend? 
It's pretty. I, well, you've seen pictures. It's yeah. definitely pretty, but Didn't yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think right now it's ten bucks just to get into the parking area, and I, I think soon uh, there was actually a tourist that was ran over by a tour bus. So <laughs> the parking area itself is very unsafe. So I think they're going to start busing tourists from Page. And I, and and oddly, I don't know how this works, but the city of Page is collecting the money, it's collecting the fees. It's not the park service. You, so you still don't need a park pass to get in there to see it. You just pay. 10 bucks to the city of Page. But, yeah. Any other? Yeah, Rich. On, on those, uh, the dams, the, the dams. Oh, yes. So did you, I mean, did you, did you see the custom evidence? I mean, some's got to be hanging out, right? If there were dams there, given the amount of the decision, it seems like you should be able to see some I, I personally, yeah, I personally haven't seen it. I'm, I'm trying to remember. It's been a while since I've looked at those. I think near Lee's Ferry, there's a few places where there are some lacustrine-like deposits that have been found, but there have been alternative explanations for them. So I, I, I'm not sure anything super definitive. Like, yeah, those are definitely lacustrine at a high elevation, which is, which would be consistent with a, you know, kind of a, 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 a lake of that magnitude. So I think it's, yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen it. I, I guess I'm a little bit doubtful. I, I kind of think most of those landslides is probably just a cooler, wetter climate and the Pleistocene is kind of my vote for the origin of a lot of those big landslides rather than a lake, but who knows? Yeah. The lakes? No, the Oh, the landslides. Uh, I mean, essentially anywhere, I mean, they're, they're all over the place, especially the, the San Juan arm. Um, you know, it, if you look at, I didn't really point it out, but you've got the high water mark. So a lot of times you can tell how active some of these, at least around the lake, you can, act, you can tell how active they've been by how much the high water mark that was, you know, first reached in 1980 has slumped down. But... Oh, oh, those ones, yeah. You see landslides at a similar elevation. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Are those dams or are they clustered? Uh, I'm not aware of any. I mean, it's just relative, you know, just based on the amount of incision. And so you look at it, and it's like, oh, it's been, it's, you know, at least several thousand years. But nothing, I'm not aware of any, you know, cosmogenic, any specific dates. Yeah, and I don't know. Thank you. Let's do, uh, I need to write down. well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh,